fuel. And amateur rocket, and actually this presentation is a little bit wrong in the word amateur when I used in the title. Amateur rocket is any size rocket using any kind of motor anywhere, anyhow. And uh, that's a whole other discussion we can talk about, take another hour or more. <coughs> and we're not, there we go. All right, level one, build the airframe, assemble what's known as an H motor, that gets you into the high power range, launch it and get it back, and you get to level one. Level two, build an airframe, launch it with a higher power motor, take a written test, and launch it and bring it back safely. Now you're level two. You wanna be level three? Develop a project build plan, have a mentor approve it, have somebody watching you over as you're building and designing, keeping to your build plan, costs, everything involved, complete set of structural drawings, simulations, flight tests, it's a mini NASA, it really is. Then you must employ electronics to bring the deployment systems in place. Assemble an M motor, which is the first level of level three. Launch it and successfully recover it. And then you got your level three. My first attempt at level three failed because a quarter of a second into the flight, the motor casing exploded and the rocket didn't go anywhere, but it was really impressive. So I waited a year to rebuild it and do it all over again. Not of mine, <laughs> not of mine, but you got some others in there. So the flight profile of a rocket, lift off, powered flight, accelerated by the motor, burnout. After burnout, what does it do? It's got lots of momentum. It keeps going until gravity what? Pulls it back. When it gets to the highest point, it's apogee. At apogee, one of two things should happen. Either a parachute pops out, when you separate the airframe in some way and bring it back safely. If you don't, what happens? You're ballistic. We've had a couple that electronics completely failed, and you know what, when they come down, they almost are coming down as fast as they went up. And then we got people on MDRA's uh, rocket field out in the east, eastern shore with backhoes digging the thing out. <laughs> In-flight forces. You've got your thrust, which is the force produced by the rocket motor, and lifts it up off the ground. It's fighting against two things. It's fighting against gravity, and it's fighting against drag. For the first second or so, it's mainly gravity that's fighting, because drag is not building up yet. As that speed increases, drag is building up by the square of the velocity. So the faster that rocket starts going, the more that drag is trying to push it back down. It's like sticking your hand out of the window of a car. You can feel it. Push it this way, it pushes it way back. You push it this way, it slices through. So the design of rockets will have a lot to do with how the fins are designed, how the nose cones are developed, et cetera. These are the slides that are going to go through real fast because we're not going to have time to go through them. If anyone cares, you can look at the equations and see if you can make sense of them. But there's software now that does this. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, I used to do this in pen and paper. No, now you just plug it into a computer and it does it all for you, right? So rockets slide along a launch rail because they're fin stabilized. There's nothing active in controlling it. So when it's just leaving the ground, you know, it can go any way it wants, really. It's got to get up to about 44 feet per second before the fins are going to stabilize the rocket. So they're launched on what's known as rails. Depending on how big the rocket is, the rails can be 12 feet tall, 18 feet tall. Some of our bigger ones need whole structures that have to be built at a launch site that are 30 feet tall in order to keep that rocket moving straight up until it hits that uh, um, magic velocity of 44 feet per second. So the big thing you're gonna learn about engineering and rockets, if you learn anything at all tonight, is there's two things that happen on a rocket. One is the center of pressure, and the other is the center of gravity. If you take a rocket and balance it on your finger, that's the center of gravity. That's where it will tend to keep stable just by sitting there and balancing. The center of pressure is if you can imagine this as being a two-dimensional sheet and you blow on it, where will it twist and come to a stop? More area over here, so you're going to need more exposed over here. That's the center of pressure. Right? That's where it's going to want to turn in the wind. So if your center of gravity 
is in front of your center of pressure, you got a stable rocket. If you flip those two, you have what's known as the bottle rockets that people try to launch out of like literally rockets and bottles on the ground. They go all over the place. If they're equal, you're neutral. If you leave that rail going up straight and there's no wind, you're in good shape. Prince Star is going to keep going straight. A little bit of wind pushes on the fins, and there you go. <laughs> you get what's known as a land shark. That's when they start flying all over the ground. All right, more equations, that's good. This is an engineering presentation. I had to put lots of equations in, right? Another one I want to talk about a little bit more important, leave the equation up a little bit. And that has to do with what happens when the parachute opens. And how big a parachute do you need? If you have a lightweight rocket, parachute can be probably pretty small. If you have a really heavy rocket, you better have a decent sized chute on it or it's going to be coming down too fast. Same drag equation that was impeding the rocket's trajectory up applies when it's coming back down. Get a big enough parachute and the drag on that parachute is holding up the weight of that rocket and it can come down nice and slow. So how slow is slow? 15 to 20 feet per second. Some people might say, ah, it's not very slow. <laughs> but that's about all you're going to get. I mean, if you get less than that, you've got some super, super large shoots and you've got other issues you've got to deal with. But getting it down to that point, you're in good shape. So those are all the equations. So how do we deal with it? How do guys like I deal with it? One of the products we use is put up by Apogee Components called RockSim. It is a full CAD package. You can design the entire rocket in this application. It has a parts list. You can add your own parts to it. Fool around with the dimensions, the fin shapes, the sizes, the dimensions, everything. Simulate its launch. Give it all the types of conditions, the wind speeds, the temperature, the humidity, where you're launching from. And once you're convinced that that rocket is going to fly perfect and it's going to do just what you want, then you bring it to the field and find out just why we say simulations aren't all what they're up to be. <laughs> There's lots of other things that can happen, but at least this gives you a, a good heads up on getting it stable and you know you're not going to have some uh, what we call really cool flight. So I'll give you the flight profile. Uh, this, in fact, is the actual simulation data for the rocket that's up here. And this is the thrust. These are the actual velocities, accelerations over time. So I can determine exactly how fast it's moving, where it's going to be when it does that. Um, and this is important, you're going to see in the video later. This particular graph, there's a parameter in the drag equation known as the drag coefficient, CD. And it, it's, a, it's a unitless number. And the bigger it is, the more drag is going to be, no matter what the shape of the thing is. So you get a CD of 0.75, then if you have a nose cone or a square or whatever, the surface area is multiplied by that in the equation. But that CD has to do with the characteristics of the shape. And the CD tends to stay the same. So if you design a, a rocket and you, you know what the CD is, you know what drag force is going to be on it, you know what types of velocity curves you're going to experience, you're in good shape until you see where it does that little jump up, the bottom graph? That happens between Mach 0.85 and Mach 1.15. Chuck Yeager and those guys, that's when they talked about the wall, the barrier, right at Mach. That's what they're talking about. The whole dynamics of the rocket's flight and the fluid dynamic equations for what it's trying to do going through the air changes dramatically. And if you don't design a rocket to go Mach 1 and you put a big motor in it and you're not thinking right and you launch it, I've got a video that shows you what happens when you do that. Let's talk about the main parts of the engineering a little bit. We'll talk about the rocket airframe, the propulsion systems, the recovery systems, and the electronics. Airframes are one of the following types. Single stage, that's a single stage. You've got one motor, one airframe, end of story. Clusters, usually a single stage, more than one motor. And then you have multi-stage, Two stages, three stages attached to each other. Drop the booster off and keep going. Then there's nose cone designs. What type of nose cones do you want? What kind of fins do you want? Let me tell you something about fins. Most people pick the fins because they look cool. 
You know, the fins aren't designed like this with a split because that needed to be there for some reason. No, it just looks cool. <laughs> so I put them in. But you have to account for that little space. Motor retention, definitely want to keep the motor attached to the rocket, right? Shock cord, that's all the tethering that holds all those pieces together. All right, so when it's coming down on a parachute, that's going to split into one, two, three different pieces. And there's got to be something attached together holding it there while the parachute brings it down. So that's the shock cord. We're not going to talk a whole lot about interstage coupling. That's pretty advanced. That's how do you maintain a multiple stage rocket so that when it goes up and the booster's going up and the next stage does go up, not down. <laughs> that would be bad. Airframes are built from various materials. Cardboard, go figure. You know, cardboard is use, useful. You have a small enough high power rocket, if it's high performance enough, you can get away with cardboard. You usually enforce it with plexiglass, uh, fiberglass cloth and epoxy around it to kind of give it some strength. Phenolic, it's sort of cross between cardboard and fiberglass, but it's brittle. So it's lightweight, strong. I'm telling you, hit it hard, it'll crack. So it's, it's not used that often. Company produced what's known as MagnaFrame. They took phenolic and they interlaced it with gray vulcanized fiber like rubber. So now you got the strength of the phenolic, but it tends to give. And that's a pretty good product, actually. Filament wound fiberglass, which is what this guy's made out of. By the way, the price goes up as you go down this list. Right. So this is this you can you can stand 200 pound man stand on that bounce up and down on it's not gonna break. It's pretty strong stuff. Now, if you want the super strong stuff and you want it to weigh like a third, then you go to carbon fiber. All right, carbon fiber. If I wanted to build just this piece of it in carbon fiber, just that tube, it's three hundred ninety-five dollars. And if I ordered three or more tubes at once, I'd get a notified statement from the company I'm trying to buy it for saying, you got your special form? Because the government doesn't like people buying a bunch of carbon fiber. <laughs> they say, what are you up to? You try to build carbon fiber or cloth, they only let you have like a couple of square yards before you got to have that form filled out. So and I don't do carbon fiber. It's just too much trouble. Single stage, single motor, with or without a payload. That has a payload section in it. So you can put anything you like in there, except living creatures. They suggest you not do that. Motor mount recovery coupler, that's basically the design, nose cone at the top. Some folks in the rocketry clubs call this the 3FNC. Three fins and a nose cone. Basically what it is. Clusters, more interesting. Two, three, four different orientations of clustered motors all together. Maybe they all fire on the ground at the same time. Maybe they do what's known as air starting, where one of them takes off, and then a little while later, the next flight, and a little while later, the next flight. Now you get wow factors from the people watching when that happens. They could be elaborate. We talked about air starting already. They can be outboard clustering, where you literally got the rocket motor sitting out from the axis of the rocket mainframe's body. You notice those things are canted out. All right, the reason they're canted out, if you actually follow the lines of those two thrust lines, they're going to intersect at a point in the rocket. Guess what that point is? The C, uh, it's actually the CG, I believe. It's actually the CG. And what's going to happen at that point is if one of those motors doesn't light, it'll still go straight up. You find at rocket clubs all the time, somebody has got this great idea of making these really cool rockets with all these outboard motors and they don't pay attention to that. And one of them doesn't light and off it goes. So you might be wondering at this point, isn't there somebody watching this and making sure those guys can't launch those things? The answer is yes. <laughs> There's a launch control officer, an LCO, who's in charge of all the flights launching them. Then there's an RSO, of which I tend to do quite often, and that's a range safety officer. It's got to go past me before I let you launch it. And those are the types of questions I'll ask you. You canted those motors. So you canted them to the seat. No, you didn't. Huh? Hmm. What are you putting in there? <laughs> so I'll be a little lenient, but I've turned up down some rockets before. Multi-stage. Booster, usually a high impulse motor because you got all that weight you got to get off the ground. And remember, you got to get up to 44 feet per second before it leaves that rail. 
And then after the booster's done and the sustainer takes off, the sustainer's already moving at some pretty high speed, rates of speed. And so you need a low impulse motor for that. You can just let the thing thrust out a little bit just to keep it going. And you can get some amazing altitudes out of these guys. We've gotten some three stages to go up to 40,000 feet plus. And then you do need GPS. <laughs> Good luck finding it. <laughs> all right, most difficult of all the designs to build. I have yet to build a multi-stage rocket. I've built all the other types you've seen. Nose cones, not too much to say about them. Various shapes, collaborators, ogives, cones. You see the little diagram there? It starts with a cone and goes the way down. As you go further and further down that, you get more and more stability and more effectiveness slicing through the air. So people will pick the Von Karman or the Power Series nose cone designs because they're going to give them the highest velocities and the highest altitudes. It completely reverses when you go supersonic. Now the cone is the best design. <laughs> so there is no one solution. And that's why you'll see most of the rockets that are going to go supersonic, past Mach 1, past 1.5 especially, they're going to be cones. And so design parameters change depending on what the rocket's going to be doing. Uh, fin designs, like I said, there's some basic designs, the deltas, trapezoids, they even use elliptical fin designs. Uh, groups that really want to go into contests at the model rocket world, you'll see a lot of their rockets built with elliptical fins because they will get you the fastest possible speeds the lowest possible drags. And so if they're in a contest to get to the highest altitude with little teeny motors, off they go. Fin flutter. What the heck is fin flutter? We're going to see a video later, and I hope I'm going to get done in time to do this, of what fin flutter is all about. Fin flutter, and that's the equation for it, is where a high-performance rocket was not built with the harmonics of motion for the fin to prevent it from going into one of these modes that it oscillates and just keeps going. And what happens when it does that? I don't care how strong you've attached it to the airframe, off it comes. And it always comes off when you're moving at the fastest speed possible. <laughs> so you have to figure out how to prevent that. And we have software that we use. We give it the parameters of the fin, the type of materials you use. One of the easiest ways to solve the problem is to laminate two different materials together. Because if one has a moment of, of flutter, a certain amount of oscillations per second, and the other one different, the combination of the two will never reach that harmonic sympathetic motion, and they'll kind of stay. So the easiest way to do it is laminate multiple materials together. Motor retention, how do you keep the motor in? This one just uses a simple ring. So this guy just turns off. And then that casing that's laying down, the silver casing, with the fuel in it, doesn't have any fuel in it tonight, slides in there and you close it up. The motor retention is only to keep the motor from falling out. While it's going up, it's pushing the rocket. It's not going to fall out. But when it gets up to the top and it stops burning, now you've got to keep something to keep it from falling out. And there's all kinds of designs in there for different ways to do it. This guy is one of our club members. There's his five-cluster motor, and, of course, he's a... Uh, machinist by trade, and so he has access to all kinds of lathes and stuff, and he builds his big aluminum fancy thing of jigs, and I have to go buy these things, and they're super expensive because there's not enough people in the hobby. So you don't get, you know, we're selling 100,000 units this year, we can cut the prices down. No, they're selling 10 of these, so they're going to pass all those costs over to me. <laughs> Shock cord, yeah, want to keep it together? Nylon, tubular nylon, tubular Kevlar, those are all the materials that the shock cords are made of. The quick links, and they're pretty beefy quick links on some of these, because when that rocket separates and the parachute gets ready to come out, they're going to do this snap at the end, and you better hold together or you're going to be in trouble. So there's a whole science just to do with the shock cords. And you guys just thought you'd just put a motor in a thing with a tube and a nose cone, and up it goes. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of engineering to it. And interstage couplers keep the two stages together, always a good thing. Uh, sometimes the housing of the electronics for when they separate is in there. And then you have to worry about something else. What happens when the sustainer motor fires and it's still close to the booster? 
you don't want it burning your booster up. So you got to do some sort of protection on it, or you wait until they separate far enough. Now, you've got some momentum here going up, so you can still go quite a ways. You have about two or three seconds, you can separate the two stages by about 40 feet or more, and then launch the top part. Propulsion. What do we use for fuel? The old Estes motors, which I have a sample of over here. That's an SD C63. That's all black powder and a clay nozzle and a bunch of charges in the top to blow the little shoot out. So this is a C motor. This is an APC motor, and that's a K. And again, we are going to talk about the letters in just a second. And the one laying down, that's an M. So that's your level three starting point. And then they go up all the way to P. All right, the suspense is killing me anyway. We're going to get to that in a minute, but every time you go up a ladder, you double the power of the motor. So every time you go A, B, C, you're already up four times. D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. You're up there pretty high, pretty heavy stuff. Well, high power rockets use ammonium perchlorate composite propellant. Where have you heard that before? Bright white smoke, brilliant white flame, space shuttle. Solid rocket boosters from Martin Thiokol use the exact same propellant, or I should say we use the exact same propellant as they do. And there was one point where we were having a tough time getting our propellant because NASA bought up all the supplies of the components to make it. So it's the same stuff, no different. Hybrid, a little different there. Hybrid is oxidizing gas. The APCP has the oxidizer built in in the solid state form. The nitrous oxide one uses nitrous oxide gas and then some other material for fuel. And it says whatever. It's usually PVC. You, for that matter, you can chop up a, a baked potato and put it in there and it would still work. It's amazing what it will burn if you give it enough oxygen to do it. So there it is, ammonium perchlorate. Composite means both fuel and oxidizer are mixed with a rubbery binder, keep it all together, keep it from cracking. It turns out that when I said my level three didn't go too well, the reason the thing exploded on the pad was because there were micro fractures in the fuel grains I didn't notice, and it caused more of the fuel to burn faster and it overpressurized. And it just so happens there's some folks in the back here from my company who know about the Manjiri cloud. It's the thing that stands out about 10 feet from me in all directions and things go bad or bad luck. So the very next day I get an email from the manufacturer of fuel grains telling me not to use the fuel grains. They... <laughs> so they didn't pay for the rocket, but they did pay for a new casing. They paid for a new uh, reload, which is the fuel, stuff like that. By the way, the casing on, on down there is $430. And the fuel to launch it once is $400. So it's not a hobby to get into if you have problems with your wife. They don't want to give you any money. <clears throat> oh, one other thing here too. Because we like to do this, you can put other components in to change the color of the flame, change the characteristics. So you can get bright red flame, you get green flame. Obviously, that launched the first time on a green motor. The appropriate emerald fire. Come on, that's fine. So and then different burn rate characteristics. You can get the uh, the thrust curves to change by putting in some additional or taking out some stuff, get it to change. So the one motor case can have all different types of fuels in it, and you can get different type of parameters for flight. Hybrid, um, much more complicated motor environment because you've got a tank of nitrogen ox ox oxide on the front, you have to have special valves to let it out at the right time. Uh, you got the fuel behind it, you got a special nozzle you got to worry about. And when you're at the launch site, you got to get a whole bunch of nitrous tanks there and you got to load them up. And unlike rockets with the solid fuel, which can be sitting on the pad for hours at end until the launch control officer decides he's going to launch a rocket, not so with nitrous. You got to put it in 15 minutes before and then it's got to get off the ground within about two minutes. Or you got to vent all that nitrous oxide <laughs> and do it all over again. So there's a lot of complications with hybrid. 
motor cases, I've shown you a few up there. There's various sizes and shapes that you can get. Typical high power motor, all the fuel grains on the center. You got your uh, O-rings on this side, O-rings on that side. There's the nozzle. Uh, you gotta, sometimes they'll have some powered pyrotechnics at the top with a delay charge. So if you're not using electronics, the motor will still take over, delay a certain number of time until it gets up to a point where it thinks it's at the highest point. Doesn't know, it's just counting seconds, right? And then pops the parachute out. So the motor self-contained does all that for you, just like the Estes motors. Um, most high power guys don't ever do that anymore. We put electronics in everything. And uh, so you got O-rings on both sides. And yeah, you could have the famous O-ring failure. There'll be a video of that too. See, I'm gonna get you to stay here to see the video. That's my, that's my whole goal. Thrust profile. Each motor is characterized by what's known as a thrust profile. And the total impulse, the total possible power of that motor is the thrust times the burn time. So it's the average thrust times the amount of time it's burning. That's the total power. Now, the curve is not gonna be a flat curve, necessarily. It's gonna peak up high, and then drop down, and burn a little slower, and then drop off completely. And so the characteristic curves will determine how fast a rocket will leave the ground. Sometimes a big heavy rocket, you gotta get it off really fast, getting a lot of power initially. Lighter weight rockets, you don't wanna do that, because you can get them off too fast. They undergo some other strains you don't want to have happen. And so you pick the motor profiles based upon those curves. So motor classifications. Each one goes up by two. So your model rocket, your A motor is a 2.5 impulse. That was that total impulse number I showed you. And from there they go all the way up into D. When you get to E, you're in mid power. You don't need any license or regulations to use it. You can go all the way up to G if you'd like. Now, once you cross that barrier from G to H, you're at level one. And now you have to have somebody watch you build that motor and sign you off that you know what you're doing. That stays H and I is level one. When you get to J, you're now at level two. Now you gotta take that test. When you cross from L to M, you're at level three. After level three, go at it. You got deep pockets, do what you want. And you go into the full amateur experimental, now, you do FAA clearance, you gotta do all that stuff. Launch windows, the big guys at O Motors have 15 minute launch windows, just like NASA. They don't go up, sorry, come back tomorrow. Um, so, and the clubs take all, care of all that, so that's good. Motor sizes, I'm gonna skip this slide so we can kind of move on. That's just telling you that they go from the little diameter of that to about one and a half inches to two inches to up to six and eight inches, some of those motor casings. How do they work? Surprisingly, well, these are the fuel grains. They get stuffed into that casing. The igniter actually gets pushed all the way to the top. It's got to ignite the top fuel grain first. And then as that grain starts to burn, the flames coming down in the heat will ignite the rest of the grains as it builds enough pressure up going out the nozzle. And then finally, when they're all burning, and they're burning all the way around, you see in figure seven, they're burning around each one of those grains, and then it goes off the ground. Now, all of this doesn't take very long. <laughs> it takes about a quarter of a second to a half a second, and off it goes, and that builds up that pressure really fast. If there's cracks in those grains, and they're exposing more area of the fuel sooner than they were supposed to, then that thrust curve goes way, way up initially, and the motor casing can't react and it pushes apart and they are designed, they are either snap rings or screwed enclosures so that when the casing expands, they'll pop out. And they do that because much better that the nozzle blows or the top blows and the rocket just kind of goes like this, then it explodes out. So they keep it safe. Yes, the Estes is initiated at the nozzle because it's black powder and it's all solid. There's no core. These guys have a core that bored all the way through. And if you put a circular core or a starf core or a slot core, that changes those thrust profiles in all kinds of different ways. So you gotta know which one, especially if you're making your own fuels, you gotta know what kind of bores you wanna put in there based upon the performance you want the rocket motor to give you. Recovery systems, we wanna get the stuff back, right? That's the whole idea. It's cost enough as it is. 
Single deployment, you can eject the parachute at Apogee, and if you're out west, New Mexico, California, deserts, that's fine. It's the easiest thing to do. You don't have to worry about it. Gets up to the highest point, pop the big chute out, let it drift. You got 15 miles of desert, who cares? Get in your car and off you go. There's a thing known as, bottom line there, East Coast recovery. That's what we call it here. <laughs> Nobody has a field that big here. The biggest field we have on the East Coast is up in New York, which I go to periodically. And that's like one and a half miles by three miles. So we have what's known as East Coast. Two-stage deployment. What happens here is the midsection of the rocket, the part that's broken apart here in the center of this one, that midsection is holding in the electronics bay and everything else, it has charges in it that blows the back piece off, and it opens up a teeny little parachute. It allows that rocket to come down, still going fast, went up at 800 feet per second, with just a little drogue chute. This one has like a 22-inch drogue chute on it. So this whole rocket will come down at about 115 feet per second. But it's coming down fast enough that if there's any wind, it's not drifting that much. And so you see it coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. It's coming down pretty fast, but it's not drifting too much in that wind. And then, when it gets to a predetermined point, about 800 feet up, 1,000 feet up, the electronics detect that position and that um, altitude. Then the nose section pops off, and it deploys the 8-foot parachute. And it goes, and now it is going to drift. 15 mile an hour wind is going to drift as much in the direction the wind's blowing as it does down. So, but hopefully you're down at a low enough altitude that you're still within the field boundaries and you can go get your rocket. And again, my cloud goes everywhere. So one of mine decided the electronics would fail and it blew the main chutes open at Apogee. And it drifted three and a half miles. <laughs> we took us a week and a half to go find it. Parachutes, usually ripstop nylon. Same as the man-rated chutes and it's used for parachuting, bringing people down. From, or those people like to jump out of airplanes for some reason. Droke chutes anywhere from 12 inches to 36 inches. Mains can be as large as 10 feet plus. I have a couple of rockets that use two big mains of about 8 to 12, to 10 feet each. Come down on two mains. Size them appropriately depending on your conditions. So I bring different parachutes with me at the fields depending on what the wind's doing. No wind at all? Mm, put them big ones on there. I want to break it down really safe. Uh, deployment can either use black powder charges at the top or typically triggered by electronics. There's another thing that has to happen here, too. You've got to put shear pins on the front nose cone. So right in here are four holes where little nylon shear pins go in because when that midsection separates at apogee, the two pieces are going to go pow. And if you're not holding the nose cone on, <laughs> and the nose cone goes sliding off, and there goes your mains. <laughs> so the shear pins have to be on there, and what blows them out? Well, when you appropriately pick, based on that equation, the right amount of black powder to provide enough force that'll shear the pin, the nylon pins out, and then blow the nose cone out. When the parachute comes down, you're in good shape. Does it always work perfectly like that? Mm -mm. I think my... Um, Success value is about 94, 95%, something like that. So I've lost three rockets in my whole 15 years of doing this. So a classic deployment in the sky, when you see it open up, you got the main chute, chute protector, and the nose cone, midsection, drogue, booster. So the first image you saw in the title slide of the presentation that was the Talon 2, because the Talon 1 blew up on the pad. <laughs> so that was my level 3 rocket that actually worked. And that's it coming back down. And that rocket, by the way, is 13 feet tall. This round. It weighs about 100 some pounds. Electronics provide control of the parachute deployments. They capture tons of data for you engineer types. You can get all kinds of data sit down in the confines of your nice cushy living room and computer and do all kinds of analysis. Where's velocity vectors? How much force is on the rocket? What altitude did it reach? Uh, you got air started motors? You want to make it bio factor? Or when do you launch those motors? Well, you can have it detect certain time frames that are going to happen. Got an RC controller unit in your hand? You can actually do it that way if you want. 
And up there, okay, everything's going straight. It's still moving straight. I think it's okay. Fire the other motors. That's a safe way of actually doing it. Uh, and there's tons of different types from different manufacturers, different shapes and different sizes. And they are all getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and doing more stuff. So when you look at this thing over here, that goes inside the nose. That's a GPS tracking and telemetry computer system. Well, now they're about as big as this. They do the same thing. So eventually that's going to get retired. I'll buy the new units. Electronic bay designs, that's where do you put all the electronics to do your work. That's a simple bay design. It's a sled that just slides into two quarter inch threaded rods and you put the batteries on one side, the electronics on the other side, they're all good. They can get more complicated, like this guy. This guy was a very interesting rocket. It was a crooked rocket. It was called the Acme Spitfire I designed. It's got all different shaped fins, the nose cones on crooked, the rocket's crooked. But when you look at it straight on, it's perfectly symmetrical. So it'll fly perfect. And it did. I was actually on the Discovery Channel a few years ago. And that guy launched perfectly straight. It was beautiful. And then I lost it in New York and never found it. Somebody in their backyard has got $2,500 worth of rocket electronics and stuff. <laughs> But, and there's no insurance for this that I know of. There's some data analysis for you. Um, I believe that is for this rocket. And there's stuff in there such as the point where the drogue fired. And the red line is the um, acceleration vector. So you see when it's coasting, it's not doing much accelerating. But what are these? That's when the charges blew out the main chutes. So you can detect when they actually occurred. And you can analyze this data and see if your rocket motor is actually performing the way you expected it to. And you can look at it. You see the manufacturer said this, and I'm seeing this. Hmm. I don't like that. Staging computers. All right. Staging, all kinds of things can go wrong. Enough things can go wrong with these guys as it is. Staging, you got all kinds of things to worry about. You do not want a stage to light when it's tilted, right? So it used to be tough to do because there were only a couple of manufacturers that made tilt sensors for rockets like ours. And they went out of business, so people had to make their own. And, you know, there's some good engineers out there, but some of them just don't quite get it. And it doesn't quite work. Now there's some newer ones on the market, too. And so Ultrasymmetrum, which is this guy, the Telemega, uh, will actually do... Timed events, all the data capture, GPS uh, transmits on the ham radio side, so you gotta get a ham radio license, the tech version of it. Um, tilt sensors, complete gyro sensors. So if that sustainer stage is anywhere off whatever pre-programmed angle you wanna put, it shuts the system down, and instead of igniting the sustainer, it waits for it to coast to a stop point and then it deploys the parachutes. And so everything comes, you don't get the big super fly flight, but you get everything back <laughs> in one piece. So they got some pretty good stuff on the market for that. And then, of course, GPS, that is the unit that's in this rocket. Cool things you can do is this also transmits files in KAH, it was a KHL format or KML format. So you load them into Google Earth, and you see a three-dimensional view of what actually took place. And so for this particular one, I was really curious about the parameters because you went up, came down, and then did one of these. And so we pointed that out to some folks when I was giving a demonstration, this presentation to the Rocket Club folks. That's the wind shear at low altitude. And you actually saw it. Some of the wind's blowing that way, and then 100 feet later, it's blowing the other direction. <laughs> and the rocket was coming out. So you can do some cool stuff with... Uh, Google Earth when you load all this stuff in. And I managed to get it done in time. Wow, pretty cool. I hope I didn't go too fast, but um, I had another 50, 60 slides I could have shown. But. Do you want to do the videos first before the uh, questions? So you guys, want to do the videos first before the questions? Fire away. I'll leave my mic on because I might want to narrate some of the stuff. Okay, so you're gonna see some cool rockets, I hope. Huh? These are all PG. <laughs> When engineering works well. All 
That's an N motor with six M's. All light lit on the ground at the same time. And peak velocity on that got just under Mach 0.7. Of course, we do enjoy our braces. Two years ago in New York, we had 16 go up at the same time. Guys had real fun trying to figure out which one was theirs when I look at them. Two stage with onboard video. See how long it took before the sustainer went? I forget what the altitude on this was. I think it was like 16, 17,000 feet. None. It's hard to keep it from spinning. Atmosphere is thin up there. And here's a time lapse I cut out about five minutes so you can see it coming down and hitting the ground. Good chunk. 27,000 feet, two stage. It looks like it's really doing one of these. It's really not. It's still really going fairly straight up. These are air started outboards. It's the actual Bowmark scale version of the Bowmark. So it's going to go up on a big booster, and then it's going to light those two outboards later. And here they come. Boom! Gemini DC, it's a, I think it was an SD's kit that had rear ejecting parachutes. This guy decided to make an upscale. Upscale means you make it bigger than the original. And it had like seven or eight parachutes total. <laughs> this is out in Nevada. Black Rock, Nevada. And lo and behold, they come out of the back. It sounds easy, but it's not. <laughs> Coming out of the back is really hard to do. And here come the rest of the shoots. <laughs> One of the biggest rockets ever to be launched by an amateur, seven motor cluster Gila monster. Green. I think, I think that guy went 40,000 feet. Three stage. Separation, ignition, separation, barely see it. There it is. We don't see very many three stages launched on the East Coast. Okay. Two stage. I couldn't find out what failed on this, but it's cool. So what happens is the rear closure blows out and the nozzle comes out. So do all the fuel grains. <laughs> and now they're not pressurized, so they'll burn a long time. Huh? Oh yeah, or at least the parachutes, all right. <laughs> what happens if the forward end blows out? 
Now that's an O motor on that guy. Black Rock, Nevada. And guess what? It's still lit. About six minutes later, it finally went out. <laughs> oh, remember the fin flutter problem I talked about? <laughs> no, you're going to go knock if you didn't design the fins right. <laughs> you have a problem. Uh, here's a slow motion of it, too. Watch these fins. Those are fiberglass fins, quarter inch thick. They're thicker than these, and they're really strong. You don't want your R rocket, which is going to go supersonic, to lose its nose cone one second into the floor. You can't hear the guys talking, but they're back there saying, oh, no, because now it's going to go supersonic right here. And as soon as it does, <laughs> Square frontage areas are not good for supersonic flights, only cones. And the last one, this was launched in uh, Maryland just a few years ago. Uh, one night scale Saturn 1B. Blue the O ring. Oh, right. Second stage did go off. I think there's a one half motion speed more version of this too. By the way, he's not that close. The camera just makes it look that way. So he got back the top stage. That was about it. And here it is in slow mo. foam that is not non-flammable. Probably could have survived some of it, but as soon as that booster blew like that, it just engulfed the foam and everything inside. It was over. So sometimes they're really cool <laughs> as opposed to just cool. All right, I got time for questions. Okay. Where can we go to watch? Um, best place here is my club out in Eastern Shore. It's called MDRA. By the way, the last slide of the presentation has all the links. Um, it's mdrocketry.org, and it's in Price, Maryland. And right now they're at the smaller field, so they don't launch the big stuff. Uh, but in the fall, they put the big stuff up again. Before we take any other questions, just uh, we are streaming on the net. So if you take the microphone, just raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone over to you. There you go. Um, excuse me, I'm right here. So, do these do these throw off a radar, radar profile, and does it have any concern to people watching? No, that kind of stuff? Um, we have to file what's known as a NOTAM notice to airmen, and so the field is supposed to have nobody flying over it. And then the ones that go more than about fifteen thousand feet, we have waiver limits, and at those we get FAA clearances. You have to have the window, and they tell people we did have one. Really dangerous thing happened, almost could have been dangerous. Um, and they weren't paying attention, it wasn't our fault. We had one of these big rockets coming down with these three big parachutes and the netting. It's nice and slow. And a uh, medevac helicopter from the state police wasn't paying attention, it was flying right over the field. He saw it just at the right time and that helicopter just took off and did one of these. If he had hit it, it would have tangled the rotors and it would have been all over. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be able to launch that field anymore either. Because it would be our fault no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you guys uh, have talked about the uh, SpaceX recovery. Oh, yeah. I watched that oh, yeah. uh, this afternoon, and I was kind of impressed <laughs> at 
how primitive it was that he, he seems to be trying to do everything with just uh, thrust an angle. Yep. And uh, you know they they seemed to find the barge okay, and they were vertical when it hit the barge, but there was a lot of angular momentum there. Right. It came down way too hot in the wrong angle, from what I understand. I was just looking at it before I came here tonight. But and um, it seems like they, uh, you know, some uh, some uh, assisting rockets near the top to take the uh, I wouldn't angle doubt if you out. see that showing up pretty soon. <laughs> now, on a note, remember these are fin stabilized, so we don't do any of that stuff, and we certainly don't land them. But there is a group right now that is getting ready to break five world records. They're the the experimental group at a Boston college, and they are going to put up a rocket with active guidance. An amateur rocket with active guidance, and they're going into space. They're going suborbital. So July 2015, they're going to attempt to go suborbital. And this is just a guy, bunch of guys like me putting a rocket up. <laughs> Do that. <laughs> now, OK, yeah, yeah. you had mentioned that the um, government was interested if you were trying to use carbon fiber. Are they interested in other things you're doing? You oh, know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. In fact, in, uh, and I'm going to try to make this fast because there are you want more questions. Uh, the propellants were actually rated as explosives incorrectly in 1964. And nobody bothered to change the rules. They said, oh, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. And then 9-11 occurred. And then the government says, anybody who takes anything off the list that's called explosives has to be regulated, controlled, fingerprinted. And we went, what? because they rated all these motors incorrectly. So we were the, one of the few organizations ever to apply a lawsuit against a federal agency and win. Took 10 years, but we won. So now they're not unregulated. Before we take our next question, if you have not gotten a green ticket for the book drawing, please raise your hand. So if you do not have a green ticket for tonight's book drawing, please raise your hand in our Esteemed Secretary Mark Kazmarek will come around and give you one. Uh, why is doing that? Doing that. Here, uh, the question I have is: Do you guys like do like competitions? Yes. And if you do, what, what parameters or criteria are you competing against? Okay, in the model rocket world, in the NAR, there's a whole slew of competitions for uh, kids, adults, whatever, different classes of, of groups. In the high power. There's not that many competitions, per se, that actually mean anything. Most of them are just, who can put up the coolest looking rocket? Cool colors, you know, flames all over the place. They even have this ratio now we call the cool factor. It's the ratio of how big the flame is to the length of the rocket. <laughs> and of course, the drag races, the drag races. And drag races do have parameters. Whoever gets off the pad first gets a point. Whoever gets the highest altitude gets a point. And whoever lands last gets a point. So there's conflicting parameters. How do you know the altitude in real time? Uh, you don't. Ah, the altimeters when they come back, so you got to get the rockets back, will have that curve trace, and you'll know what altitudes they hit. Some of these, like this one, will transmit in real time. So when I launch this guy, I've got a laptop computer sitting there, and you can actually watch it blipping on, you, on Google Earth as it's going up. And it'll show the velocity, acceleration, arrows going around. It's really cool. <laughs> So I did have, uh, you might have explained it, maybe I just missed it. Why is there such interest in the carbon fiber from the government and having too much? Is it an environmental thing, the EPA or? No. You can't detect carbon very easily. Well, things can go through it all the time. It's extremely lightweight and very strong. So if you can find a carbon fiber tube and cap it with carbon fiber glassing around it. You think a pipe bomb is bad? That's one of the things. And then there's, I don't know, there's some other concerns that they think we're going to use it for all kinds of other nefarious things. I don't know. Who knows what goes in the minds of those folks? You. Thanks. <laughs> well, I think to tie that in with, with next month's meeting, I think we'll create a 3D yeah. printer for carbon yeah. fiber, and then we'll have really yeah. a lot of fun and, and see which watch list yeah, we're going to be I'm on I'm really month. interested in next week's presentation because we got some guys in our club who are designing what we call them fin cans, and they're a complete one piece of this whole section 3D printed. And they make their own camera mounts 3D printed. You know, why buy them from manufacturers? They can't fit right. I'll make my own. <laughs> 
So 3D printers are really coming up. Cool. All right. So Michael, thank you very much for tonight. Sure. We have a hope you enjoy a, it. Uh, Certificate of appreciation. Thank you, sir. And then, and then we also have a caffeine delivery system. Oh, I need one of also, those. everybody needs one, need of those. one of these. And thank you very much for the night. Thanks. Appreciate it. And we also we have the drawing for a book of your choice. Yes, we do. And uh, 